Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, uh, webinar on uh, uh, one in a series being run by Smart Transport, this one on rural accessibility for all. My name is Stephen Joseph. I chair the Smart Transport program uh, within Bauer Media um, and I'm also for relevant to this discussion. I'm also a visiting professor at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, the, the issue about rural transport is one that doesn't uh, often get a lot of attention. Um, it, it, there's one of the thing, the interesting issues that we found um, from the university is that a lot of the, uh, uh, much of the research and policy attention goes on um, cities. And there's good reasons for that because cities are uh, economic powerhouses. But um, I think um, there are big issues in terms of rural transport. Um, it, a lot of um, places um, outside cities who have a mix of commuter towns, market towns, uh, villages, um, uh, and some historic cities um, are uh, have big transport problems. Public transport is often very poor. There's a very high levels of car dependence. Walking and cycling for short journeys isn't always very attractive. Um, and there's also, in many of these areas, a lot of house building going on, um, which um, can be very car dependent. So I think it's timely that we're having this webinar to look at what might be done to improve um, accessibility in rural areas um, and moving away from single occupancy car use. What you'll hear today are a set of presentations um, uh, we will hear from Martin Tugwell, who's the director of England's Economic Heartland, one of the uh, many now subnational transport bodies set up in England. Um, we'll hear from Ben Lawson, who's the vice president of the Enterprise Group, who will talk about the work that Enterprise are doing um, in partnership, in some cases with others, um, looking at um, options for um, rural accessibility outside cities. And we'll hear from James Gleave, who's the director of Mobility Lab, on how to engage people um, in dealing with um, transport issues, um, particularly outside cities. We hopefully will also hear from James Palmer, who's the mayor of Cambridge and Peterborough, um, though I have to say, um, possibly unsurprisingly, given the nature of the crisis that we're going through, um, he's now been called away to another urgent meeting, um, but hopes to join us later. Um, as I've said, there are um, a set of um, the, these issues about what to do about rural accessibility um, are important. Um, and uh, at the University of Hertfordshire, we're doing a programme of roundtables and research, looking at options for what we might do um, uh, outside cities. Um, we're doing that in collaboration with the Department for Transport, with Martin and his colleagues at England's Economic Heartland, um, with the Connected Places Catapult, um, Hertfordshire County Council, and also the um, Gasco and Cecil Estates. And um, we'll be, um, we, we've started to do a programme of roundtables. These are now migrating online um, with a view to producing ideas on how to, on practical ideas, for local authorities and others in terms of dealing with transport outside cities. Um, well, without more ado, I'm going to ask um, Martin Tugwell um, to uh, speak first to describe what um, uh, the England's Economic Heartland are doing and what his perspective is on um, transport outside cities. Martin. Well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this webinar. Um, it's a, it's great to be able to do this and to be able to share some thoughts and reflections on the challenge that uh, improving connectivity for the communities outside our urban centres um, in this in this ever changing and quite challenging environment. Um, just to sort of set up um, who we are, uh, as Stephen said by way of introduction, uh, England's Economic Heartland is one of uh, seven subnational transport bodies for England. Uh, we include the area that is covered by the Oxford to Cambridge Park. And it's useful to remember the basis on which we came together, um, the political leaders and the business community. And it was this recognition that there are a number of issues which extend beyond a single area. 
Uh, there are also issues, and I think this is a this particular topic is one where um, it, it falls very squarely into this, where uh, um, coordinating our responses and understanding uh, the issues and addressing them on a on a common basis actually brings some strength. And of course, there's that message about the importance of working to integrate investment, and I think uh, that's a theme which I'll develop a little bit as we go through this conversation. Um, Here's a region of opportunity. Um, now, I think a, a number of times during this, this presentation, I'll mention the, uh, the current situation and also the fact that uh, undoubtedly we're heading into a recession and that's going to be a quite painful and it's going to be quite impactful. But if we think about the long term potential of the region, then it is undoubtedly one of huge economic potential. And the importance of realising that economic potential is going to be even more critical in the uh, years that come. And we do need, when we're starting to think about some of these issues, to, to be able to see what's happening in the short term, but doing that within the longer term framework. But it's not just about the economy at any price. It is about understanding how we deliver and realise that growth in a way that achieves the net environmental benefit. And that's been a key driver throughout our work. Just to kind of reflect a little bit on some of the challenges. I mean, we know um, the work that's been associated with the develop the draft transport strategy, work on which will come to a culmination with its publication in, uh, in July for formal consultation, is knowing that um, even before the current situation, we knew that the current pattern of travel and consumption resources is not compatible with the need to deliver um, net zero carbon no later than 2050. The need for that change um, has been established for some time, as has the need for changing um, travel behaviours, for actually reducing the need to travel, um, for increasing the use of active travel modes. These are not new ideas, and, and to some extent they still remain valid now. If we think about our experience of the last few weeks, we've all seen the experience of uh, how reduced traffic is having a benefit impact on uh, air quality, on the environment. We've seen people in urban areas reclaiming streets for walking and cycling in ways that perhaps we might have aspired to but not have realised before. And we've also um, we've seen um, the uh, issues about quality of life coming very much to the fore. So issues not just about how uh, the changes in the, the work environment but also the implications of that for individuals. Now, what that then leads us to think about is how um, it, it, we've also got some messages that were some learning to take from, from the last few weeks that we can build upon. We've seen how um, the scale of activity that can take place remotely, the number of stories of uh, people who live in one part, uh, live at home and working from home now, rather than having a two or three hour commute to the office, uh, are quite widespread. We've that that's really highlighted the importance of digital connectivity in our rural areas, the importance of making sure that digital connectivity allows people to work remotely. It's also reminded us that if we approach these things strategically and actually deal them on a consistent way, the ability to change is quite significant and to change at quite a rapid pace. What comes out of those positives is the fact that we need to think about how we then move forward by retaining some of those benefits, but recognise that we have to restart the economy and that in all of those scenarios, connectivity in rural areas is going to be really important. For us as a region, over 35% of our population live in small market towns in their hinterland, much higher than the national average. People tend to travel longer distances, um, not surprising given that distribution of the population. But we know that as a consequence of that, the, 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 the carbon emissions are much higher and more worryingly until the current situation uh, came forward, the decline in the emissions was actually slower than the national average. So all of this tells us that in areas where we have low population density, particularly rural areas, the smaller urban areas, some of the issues about connectivity is about access to services and employment. And if we don't address those issues, we're going to deny them choice and opportunity. And that deny that uh, that in turn will actually limit the potential of people to, to realize their potential. All of that 
means that we now need to have a new approach. And that's what's been set out within the draft transport strategy, which, as I mentioned earlier, will be published later this summer. The vision is very much focused around um, innovation, is about sustainable economic opportunities, but it's also about this quality of life and decarbonising the transport system. Those issues, I think, remain as valid now as they did um, when we were drafting them earlier in this, this year. We've got key principles which drive that forward. Um, it's interesting when we've talked about the, the decarbonising agenda that at the time people were, some parts of our communities were actually pressing for that to be a hard, a faster journey than, um, than 2050. But as I'll touch on in a minute, it's very much dependent upon policies in other areas and issues in other areas. Moving on from kind of what the key issues of connectivity in our rural communities are, I think Again, whilst these come from the work on our draft transport strategy, for me, they are as valid and they've in many ways been reinforced by our experiences of the last few weeks. We know that for the rural communities, digital connectivity is absolutely critical for those businesses that are actually based in them. We know um, many parts of our communities now, uh, many businesses are actually taking, have chosen to locate themselves in, in the smaller towns and rural communities because of other factors, quality of life, etc. Um, and so digital connectivity for them is absolutely fundamental and provides us with an opportunity to, to allow them to uh, see their success benefiting the communities in which they are, are based. We know that the digital economy was um, and indeed is in continuing to encourage new business models. I think what we're seeing um, is that, that that trend being accelerated. We've seen a number of significant retailers going into administration in the last few weeks. Um, administration that perhaps may not have been surprising in terms of the, the fact that they've gone into administration. It's more about the timing of it in some respects, the COVID virus has accelerated a trend there and we've been seeing that, the, that as, a, as a community we've been drawing on um, the digital economy to maintain access to some of their services and facilities and we all know that the traditional models for providing public transport in rural areas are, are increasingly unsustainable indeed it, it's almost been the challenge for us as we've been trying to see how we can fix a broken model rather than necessarily thinking about what is the new model moving forward and i think the current situation gives us an opportunity to seize that as a as a moment to think about what is it that we need to move forward stephen in his introduction talked a little bit about um the you know the challenge of these rural areas the one observation that i think we need to bear in mind is it's not a a, a homogeneous collection of market towns in the old um language of uh, estate agents is it's about location and um, we have got some small towns who are very close proximity to larger urban areas whose um, relationship is driven by that that uh, that function in support of a, a, a larger urban area and as a consequence the concentration of tra transport and opportunities for transport are provide um, chances to do things uh, in a way that support active travel and public transport other similar town sized towns might be more rurally located uh, and have a very different function. They might be the centre for that rural hinterland. You need to think about these locations, in, not just in isolation, but in relative to their hierarchy more generally. And we mustn't forget, and I think again, the experience of the last few weeks has highlighted this even further, it's about what happens in other areas of public policy and other areas of activity. It's not just about integrating long-term land use policy with, with transport policy. It's actually understanding that if um, the continuation with the digital economy uh, accelerates, if we see the way services are delivered changing, then we will see um, the needs for transport and, and, and deliverability uh, changing as well. So what we need is we need an inclusive transport system. We need something which harnesses this, this ability of the digital economy to, uh, to, to change. We need to, um, we need to recognize that um, the digital economy is going to change things. We've seen uh, large businesses, many businesses now operating remotely. And if I was in their shoes with a, with a, a laden um, bank uh, a balance sheet, 
Um, I'd be thinking seriously about do we need to continue with the old model of uh, trying to get people from rural communities to business parks to sit in an office to then go back to their rural communities. There's a fundamental change here coming forward. And to help us deliver that um, uh, change, we need to be using the insight that we can have from analysis, analyzing uh, existing travel patterns. As a subnational transport body, we have a very detailed regional evidence base. One of the bits of that is an, uh, is an understanding of, of the, the population behaviours right across the region, um, looking at um, behaviours and differences in behaviours between the urban areas and rural areas. We need to go into that level of understanding the user expectation, the user needs, to be able to actually take these things forward um, in terms of thinking about how we identify what we move and that's where we need to think about uh, and have a different approach so when we're appraising ideas when we're putting forward proposals it's not just about the financial value for money it's about how they contribute to these wider sustainable outcomes as well as uh, delivering on the decarbonisation um, uh, targets in all of this there is a danger that we focus on people who have the luxury of being able to make some of these choices. And we mustn't forget, um, and indeed across our region, out of our population of 5.1 million, we have something like 800,000 people who live in the top third uh, areas of, 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 of deprivation. And, and so the choices that we're asking people and the changes need to work for those for whom connectivity and mobility at the moment is actually a barrier to achieving their potential. This is not about choosing to do things differently and, and reducing travel. In some instances, it's about meeting their expectations to be able to have access to different, um, different opportunities and indeed potentially travel further more. So that means we need to think about how we use accessibility hubs as a way of countering that, because it might be about developing local drop-in centres in uh, in our rural communities, places where people can work in a communal hub without the need to be able to uh, travel long distances to their traditional place of work. Bringing it all together is about transforming journeys. And what we need at a regional level is we need this kind of policy framework that, um, first of all, continues to prioritise the need to decarbonise the transport system puts a user at the heart of our transport system, thinks about what is it we're trying to achieve as outcomes and what is it that we're trying to do uh, to help support the individual realise the potential. Undoubtedly, we're going to see the need for investment in digital infrastructure, both fixed and mobile, really escalating up the agenda, more so for rural areas where this is an issue and where their potential for change and the benefit of that change is going to be significant. And we used to use that that digital connectivity to then think about how we deliver um, things that, and uh, achieve the hierarchy of travel modes with more emphasis on active travel to and from those mobility hubs, or accessibility hubs, to and from the public transport. Because where we are making investment in strategic infrastructure, and I know Mayor Palmer will talk about the CAM shortly, hopefully, uh, but it's not just things like the CAM, it's also things like East West Rail. Um, where we're fundamentally changing the, the strategic infrastructure, infrastructure, we then need to use that new approach to investing in the infrastructure to prioritise the local connectivity from those rural communities, from those hinterlands, and using the infrastructure like East West Rail as a hub that gives you access to the wider region. And finally, in all of this, we need to make sure we don't forget freight and logistics. It's very easy to have this conversation thinking about what does it mean for me as an individual? What does it mean for me uh, in terms of not going to work, which is clearly a, an issue. But we're also relying upon more freight and logistics operations to support a different way of working. And it's interesting to see that uh, when the pressure was on the supermarkets to, uh, to maintain supplies, there was actually a recognition that the infrastructure for home deliveries just does not exist if everybody decided to rely upon um, home delivery. And actually, would we want um, the cars that we used to have on our roads being replaced by, by simply more and more vans delivering in-store uh, deliveries? So there's some really real significant challenges there. Um, all of that policy framework will come forward for our region in the draft transport strategy, along with the supporting technical evidence base and with our proposals for taking uh, the work forward into implementation. That will take place within um, July, um, but 
working with our partners, we'll then see how we actually apply that at a local level through a series of connectivity studies to make sure that we do get this connection between the strategic conversation and making sure at a local level it responds to the needs of the individual. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Um, uh, I think that was very interesting and raised a lot of um, really interesting issues. Uh, as Martin and I said, this Economic Heartland is one of a series of, um, uh, of such subnational transport bodies in England, um, and um, they're all at various stages of developing the kind of um, subnational transport strategy that Martin described. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how those develop in the future. Um, anyway, I can now tell you that um, uh, James Palmer, the mayor for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, um, is is on the line and able to talk um, about um, the approach that is being taken in Cambridgeshire um, and Peterborough towards um, rural accessibility, with a particular focus on the uh, Cambridgeshire Autonomous Metro. Uh, James, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, and apologies uh, for not being able to log in earlier, but I've managed to get there in the end. Um, I think there's there's several things here that uh, that are absolutely linked and uh, absolutely have to be considered in the round and as a whole. Uh, of course, transport, housing, growth and the environment are all but one side of the same square, and, and, and the reality is delivering in rural areas without delivering housing in rural areas, delivering growth in rural areas uh, without transport is virtually impossible. And what we have seen, actually, uh, you could you could put Cambridge and the Cambridge region uh, as a uh, uh, as an example of how growth can occur uh, and can also potentially be stymied if there is no investment into infrastructure. And of course, with investment in, in, into infrastructure, it's not just investment into uh, any infrastructure, but the right infrastructure to deliver growth as well. And um, ultimately, Cambridgeshire is, is, is struggling now because we are seeing very, very high house prices in and around the city of Cambridge, which are, which are pushing people out into the rural economy, uh, away from South Cambridge, mostly uh, towards either Haverhill or into the Fens. Uh, and that, of course, is putting massive strain on the infrastructure that we have so that certain routes, A505, A1307, A10, uh, are, are almost unpassable on a daily basis because of the congestion. Um, the response, of course, locally uh, through the Greater Cambridge Partnership has been very short term and very blinkered and also very protective of a very small part of the county. Uh, and what we're trying to do for the command authority area is trying to deliver a transport solution um, across the entirety of Cambridgeshire uh, in a very bold and uh, almost unprecedented step to deliver world-class public transport in a rural county. And the, the sort of wisdom on metros and on, on uh, dedicated transport routes is that yes, you can do them in cities of over half a million people, but don't even try and do it in a rural area because it doesn't work. Uh, and I am very much set to challenge that, and I will challenge that, and the Command Authority will challenge that, and our partners in delivery will challenge that. And what we're actually trying to deliver across the entirety of Cambridgeshire is a transport network that will bring forward new housing, uh, that will allow for the future growth of the economy but will also protect not just the natural environment, but the built environment. What we've seen, uh, not just in Cambridgeshire, of course, across the whole of the country, and uh, this will resonate, I'm sure, with planning authorities, is because of a lack of transport plan in many areas, or in almost all areas, particularly rural areas, uh, are suitable transport solutions. We've seen next field development, poor quality housing, uh, villages and towns swamped and engulfed with inappropriate development just because they're the only places with schools and doctors uh, and it's short-term thinking and long-term pain and what it's led to of course 
is what we see across the country, which is a massive uh, amount of people who are against any type of new housing at all. Uh, and, uh, and of course, those people already have houses. Um, and, and ultimately, those people who are against new housing and see the problems in it, almost all their arguments are sound, apart from the argument, of course, that, that young people can't afford to buy houses and build houses. Um, but almost the, all of the other arguments uh, are sound. The, the infrastructure can't cope. Well, invariably, it can't. Uh, uh, the doctor's surgeries, the schools can't cope. Invariably, they can't. So we've got to try and do something better. Uh, and um, or, or we will risk that what we risk in Cambridge here is that the economy will begin to go backwards. And, and uh, when it comes to the economy in Cambridge and Peterborough, the country can't afford for the economy here to go backwards, let alone the locality itself, the local area. And we're seeing you know, in, in these, these times that the Cambridge uh, and the Cambridge economy and the life science and tech sector are even more important now than they were 10, 12 weeks ago. Uh, and yet we know how important they were to the national economy just then and, and it will be developments and uh, uh, improvements and, and, and brilliant um, innovations that come out of the laboratories and the science parks that surround Cambridge that will help us move through this crisis. So yes we need a de dedicated uh, transport solution and that dedicated transport solution the metro needs to link in new garden village sites. And it's imperative that it does that because the growth needed in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough is significant. And we're currently building around three and a half thousand homes a year in the county. And the need is for around eight and a half thousand homes a year. Um, but of course, every year we fail to build that, the, the, the need goes up. And we're hampered really by the local plan system and, and the belief of councils that they're doing enough. I think I go back probably to the Labour government uh, uh, under Prescott when Prescott was involved in housing delivery uh, and statements at the time which said the single biggest uh, um, danger to uh, the economy in the UK was South Cambridgeshire District Council. That's slightly harsh, but I, this isn't a political point. Um, it doesn't seem to matter who's in charge of South Cambridge District Council politically. The policies are still the same on housing, which is to basically build houses where they're not needed and then try and move people around the county to where they are. And as I said, we've got to do better. The Metro is planned to do that. It will deliver houses in tens of thousands. It will deliver garden villages. It will deliver environmentally uh, friendly transport. It will allow uh, land that is currently in agricultural use to become not just housing, but of course, uh, park land as well linked into those garden villages. The villages themselves can be built uh, to a quality and uh, with environmental policies that you simply cannot do in small scale, three to five to 700 to a thousand uh, uh, homes sites. Uh, and, uh, and of course we can build in those garden villages, not just the environmental positives, but, but the things that, that are necessary to create uh, a place and it's important that creating a place is significant uh, uh, front and centre of what we're trying to achieve. I think the, the other the other thing is that, that we need to do in Cambridge and Peter is we need to prove that you can deliver world class in a city and a region the size of the population that we have uh, and there are other cities not just in the UK but worldwide who will look at what we're doing and try and replicate that. What we have to allow us to raise the funding, of course, is, is very high land value and very, very strong economy. And those two areas are ways that we can raise the funds necessary locally. Uh, but we will be government intervention, of course, and we're helping. We're working very closely at the moment with Homes England, looking at our garden village sites that we have, putting forward the case for high quality development in those linked to the transport network. I don't think that what I'm saying here is particularly rocket science or hasn't been uh, done before. You'll be able to, all of you, point to garden towns and, and garden cities that we have across the UK uh, and also new towns that are being built. We seem to have forgotten, I think, that transport has to be front and centre of that. We also mustn't, I believe, wed ourselves to current thinking on transport. It doesn't 
have to be rails it doesn't have to be road based we we are working alongside the university in cambridge to try and deliver something technically advanced for the area that will be innovative that can be sold around the world and i think that's very important as well so there are many aspects to this as i've said it is there is there is not a single solution it is many solutions that are linked together the reality of what we will achieve in cambridgeshire is a transport network dedicated transport network public transport network, that will link across east to west and north to south in cambridgeshire that will bring uh, communities that are currently poorly served or poorly linked into a mainframe of a transport network that will allow a growth platform for the city of cambridge and its surrounding area uh, to thrive not just in its current position but i believe it will give it the opportunity for cambridge the cambridge sub-region to become what silicon valley is now uh, and challenge on a level playing field with cities of boston and san francisco and, and with shanghai in the far east and, and ultimately that has to be our, our our ambition but in order to realize that the 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 businesses and uh, and the politicians and the university in cambridge have to have to open their eyes to the world that surrounds them rather than closet themselves out of the blanket of the success of the city of cambridge and uh, when they finally do cast aside that blanket then i believe that we will be in a very strong position thank you very much um james that was really interesting um I, I, I think we put when afterwards when we send things around we'll we will have a slide with a map of the um uh, of the metro um uh, proposals so that people can see it um uh, i'd now like to um and, and by the way i should say the whole issue of housing and transport is a really big current issue. I'm involved in a project called Transport for New Homes, um, which has been looking at this, has been looking actually at some of the garden towns and villages uh, proposed at the moment, um, which I think it's fair to say in transport terms are great. And um, once the uh, current virus uh, out of the way will uh, um, be, or at least is, um, uh, lessened, um, there'll be a report to be released on that. Um, I'd now like to ask um, Ben Lawson, Vice President of Strategy and Mobility, uh, UK and Ireland to talk about um, what enterprise are doing on rural transport solutions. Thank you, Ben. Good. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, just being unmuted, so I'll, I'll, I'll head off in. Um, I think what I'd like to do to start is I, I sometimes get asked why enterprise should have a voice on the future of mobility. So I'm just going to take a few quick moments to point out for some of, the, uh, of you that are less familiar with enterprise what some of those reasons are. We've been a local mobility provider since 1957 and at a time when we launched rental cars were really a thing for the airports but our founder heard from his customers that they wanted mobility close to their homes or their places of business. So he listened to them and he built our business where people lived and worked because that's where they needed us to be. And what, where that's led us to in the UK is since our opening in 94, we now have over 5,500 employees throughout the UK, staffing over 470 locations. And now there's actually an enterprise location within 10 miles of 95% of the UK population. That's over 120,000 vehicles, over two and a half thousand of those are actually automated vehicles providing round the clock access uh, digitally. But as you can see from the slide, we're very much in all areas of the country, including rural, semi-rural environments as well. In fact, we're proud to be a company that offers a total travel and mobility solution, hourly car rental, yes, but also specialized needs. Uh, we've heard earlier on from Martin in terms of the need for freight and logistics to be part of the solutions. We very much offer end-to-end -end, uh, business solutions from temperature control vehicles, even accessible minibuses, and other experimental mass transit partnerships that offer single application and payment uh, platforms. We even bring our specialized fleet into the shared mobility arena, 
with minibuses, including accessible minibuses, are great examples of vehicles that can be shared by multiple sections of society at different times of the day. In fact, we're the only organisation that's taken National Car Club Network mainstream. You may have seen from the TV and billboard campaigns pictured here, featuring Gerard Butler, um, our campaigns that are bringing that to the mainstream. Unlock Car Club cars across the UK with your phone 24-7 or whatever the mission enterprise. So driving innovation like that is vital towards moving mobility forwards and capturing it in terms of consumers' perceptions. We do throughout our ent enterprise holdings venture capitalist arm uh, 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 invest a lot into future mobility. In fact, over the last decade, we've invested more than $3 billion into a variety of different innovations and startups that can help provide our customers with their changing needs. So let's take a look at that changing mobility landscape. We hear a lot about the future of mobility and all it holds from driverless cars, to hydrogen-powered hovercraft or remarkable technology that we can't even think of yet. And it's often fantastically, uh, fantastical and almost exclusively focused on major urban conurbations. Just take a look at how many of these new mobility startups are focused on London only, and even central London, not even greater London. So whilst we all aspire to get there in the years to come, the everyday lives of the people that we serve, uh, we serve require them to get from point A to point B today, not just in 2030 or in 2050. So we're here to talk about the practical steps that we're taking along with our partners and the rest of the industry and our customers now to move us forward to that amazing future while serving consumers needs today, wherever the consumers may be located. And then we're taking uh, these steps at a time where several forces are disrupting the industry. And that was before the COVID situation. So from our perspective, this kind of evolution has happened within many, many industries. Let's take a look at the music industry and how that's just been disrupted over the last several decades. We've spoken about it before, but it's an important point, particularly in the current climate. The music industry comparison, if we take a look at its, its evolution from vinyl to cassette tapes, to CD, to digital downloads, to streaming, we've changed the way that we consume music over that time. But it was a 30 year journey and each step was enabled by technology. The progress of the evolution was all about the customer. Companies can try and push their preferences, but ultimately consumer choice is what drives the adaption and adoption. And at no point were consumers forced to adopt or options removed. And here we are today with streaming in first place. But number two, surprisingly for many people, is still vinyl. And I'm often told that new mobility won't work because not everybody will adapt to it. But that's okay. Because much like in the, in the evolution in the music industry, it's not about 100% change for every single person. Change of adaption and adoption in smaller numbers, building up to large scale consumption is, is perfectly valid in our changing travel needs. So the lesson is that you have to meet consumers where they are. They have to buy into the way of thinking for change to take root. One of the key differences in transport is our mobility innovations are not always visible to consumers. So how do we drive that awareness? And as we keep this perspective in mind, there's no single mode of transport or policy solution that can on its own uh, solve this and that can meet the changing challenges that we see in both keeping up with consumer expectations and minimizing environmental impacts. But we're finding that it's very possible to move us in the right direction by creating mobility solutions that meet today's mobility challenges while helping to pave the way for tomorrow's. I'll give you a few examples of the solution in practice today and why they're relevant to rural areas. Mobility as a service, I think, is a fantastic option that needs to be pursued further. Consumers want practical solutions, not hypothetical predictions. And right now, the consumer's need is for transport to be easily accessible and on demand. And they want options where mobility as a service, by integrating and consolidating all methods of travel, Consumers can plan, book, and manage their own transportation, own shared, uh, public or private, using mobile application, 
It offers value for money, convenience, and immediate access for both business users and consumers. We're working closely with a diverse network of stakeholders, including mass transit officials, local governments, and private partners, to help provide this technology for tomorrow's mass platforms. One great case study is a pilot we did in cooperation with Transport for Greater Manchester, where a white labelled mass product for, uh, for Manchester partnered with bus, rail, enterprise services, Mobilio as the technology platform providing single ticketing and payments offering integrated transport options. At the end of the three-month pilot targeting airport employees' commutes, we achieved the largest adoption of all the participating European cities with over 1,200 users. In a survey of the 1,200 users, 100% of the participants interviewed believed that mobility service would benefit Greater Manchester. And 75% of those said they would evolve to some form of active travel if they were incentivized through mass application to do so. Another great example is the pilot with Transport for West Midlands. There, SWIFT is an electronic ticketing scheme developed for Transport for West Mids for use on public transport. We are linking the Enterprise Car Club and vehicle services into SWIFT, launching later on this month. Now that's really important because SWIFT will be the main platform that allocates mobility credits and future pilots through that West Midlands area. So it's vital that it can offer complete mobility solutions. These urban focused trials work really well in rural areas where the challenge is not just the choice of transport available, but the knowledge of those choices. Mass has a unique opportunity to show rural consumers what is available to them, how to link up multimodal journeys often linking first and last mile options to key public transit routes. It can also show potential demand or consumers inquiries, so new modals can move in to meet that demand. Our rural car clubs are thriving and consumers love them, but awareness is sometimes low. Our customers tell us that when these mobility options help them, that those mobility options help them to use public transit more frequently when supplemented by these other modes. In rural areas, that's particularly true where public transit can sometimes struggle to fulfill every need. Mobility hubs, I think, play a huge part in this as well. And we've heard from uh, both speakers before about some of the challenges in terms of transport planning with relation to development. So lack of physical infrastructure can be, uh, is, uh, is, a, is an issue in facilitating the change in travel behavior. Encouraging behavioural changes as consumers are, are unwilling or unable to give up their primary form of transport is a challenge. Today, the private car represents 83% of UK journeys and 60% of those are single occupancy. And mobility hubs must be embedded within in all the planning decisions at an early stage to ensure that the sustainable connectivity of new developments. If mass is the digital infrastructure that we uh, will facilitate a change in travel behaviour, the mobility hubs are the physical infrastructure we need to make the right modes of transport available. And these alternative modes are accessible at transport hubs or railway stations, making it easier and convenient for travellers around the UK who already use mass transit. They should also be made available in villages or community areas to link in our rural population, areas such as the garden villages we've just been hearing about. So mobility hubs accelerate the use of all modes of transit when multimodal services are found together. And we're seeing that in continental Europe where our partners in, in, in various cities are further ahead than the UK with mobility hub development. We're working with mass transit and private sector partners to deliver solutions that integrate a range of mobility options in the form of car clubs and mass transit networks in residential developments. Several years ago, these different modes, we saw ourselves as competitors, but now we understand that the complementary nature of combining different modes of transport and the impact doing so can have on reducing private vehicle ownership and the adaption of adoption of these modes. It's particularly important in rural areas where those public transit areas cannot compete with a private car journey for all required journeys. You've heard a, a, a common thread throughout this about the need for collaboration and partnership, particularly between the public and the private sectors. 
We need a great deal of collaboration between policymakers, mass transit operators, to keep us all more moving forward on this front. That's why we were founding members of the Urban Mobility Partnership, a collaboration with six other transit, the leading transit operators in the UK. This coalition is uh, providing a forum for promoting transport policy that has the needs of the consumer at its heart, whilst also working to reduce the congestion and improve air quality. With our partners, Enterprise is addressing the infrastructure gap in rural communities and at the same time allowing policymakers to achieve those reduced pollution and congestion by facilitating that, pri that reduction in private vehicle ownership. Remember, data provided by Como UK demonstrates that each car club displaces up to 18 privately owned cars. It also shows that car club members are uh, increasingly likely to use other, other variations of mass transit and active travel as well. Another great example is the work that we're doing with LiftShare, where we're working to collaborate and promote and deliver on on-demand transport solutions that advocate shared mobility. A great example here is the work we're doing with, the, with an NHS client. The NHS client who needs to build a vascular imaging unit on an existing staff car parking land. The new unit is critical to patient care. Unfortunately, the NHS staff car parking is already oversubscribed with single occupancy vehicles, a theme that would find in many NHS sites or indeed many car parks throughout our, our, our country. Staff here typically turn up around an hour before their very long shift starts just to find a space. And the new development will take away 150 existing staff car parking spaces, making the parking issues even worse. So to alleviate the issues, Enterprise and LiftShare have developed a unique solution that uses the LiftShare platform and the Enterprise Car Club vehicles to facilitate both commuting and business journeys for staff. So the partnership allows us to offer credible alternatives that map out local staffing commuting patterns and that can be shared in car club vehicles. And as you can see from the map, many of those commutes are rural in, or, or, rural in origin and public transport isn't always the option. So in launching the programme, the scheme will give staff access to more options, including car clubs, car sharing, but also promoting public transit and active, active travel. Fundamentally, it will significantly reduce the dependency on oversubscribed staff car parking areas. The scheme is set to launch soon, so we look forward to updating people in the future on its success. Another challenge is Greyfleet, both in the private and the public sector. Greyfleet contributes to high travel costs and CO2 emissions. Here, car club and shared asset models provide opportunities to slash business travel costs cut harmful CO2 and NOx emissions and improve road safety, reducing overall congestion. We're working with a number of mass transit, partners, uh, mass transit partners and private sector businesses to address grey fleet challenges and encourage people to use shared assets. One example um, is the work with Highlands Council to reduce its annual business miles by more than 825,000 miles and realise cost savings in excess of 400,000 in the first 12 months after in, uh, introducing the programme. Here, 60 Enterprise Car Club vehicles are located around 21 Highland offices, achieved a 22% reduction in grey fleet mileage, also saving 377 tonnes of CO2 uh, emissions. Now, the success of this rural programme has allowed Enterprise to successfully apply for funding for Mass Scotland, to develop the Highland scheme into a larger mass trial for partnership with Hytrans, being the transport operator, going live in September this year and focusing on adoption levels in rural communities by integrating car club with local bus and ferry transit. The mass trial and data will propel our understanding of consumer adoption and adoption in those rural areas. So in conclusion, I think to sum up, Sometimes there's a real danger of focusing too heavily on what may or may not happen by 2030 or 2050, because it can put us out of touch with the needs of people and communities who are looking to us for solutions today. The evolution of transport needs to be just that. It can't be a switch we flick the day before the target looms over us. Listening to our consumers today is helping us provide solutions in rural and semi-rural areas that will be stepping stones towards those long-term plans set out by the policymakers. To do this, we work hard with our partners to stay grounded in the travelling public's reality. 
here and now, because that's what we lead us to practical solutions that meet their needs today, while moving us closer and closer to enabling the future that we're all striving for. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. I think there's some really in, in inspiring stories there. Um, I don't know whether uh, others here, um, certainly um, James Palmer has clearly heard the, well, you can't do anything about transport in rural areas argument um, and is determined to do something about it. I think what um, Ben's presentation has shown is just how many options there are for moving away from single occupancy car use as the default in, um, uh, in rural areas areas. Um, well, I'd now like to welcome James Gleave uh, from the Mobility Lab, um, who will uh, uh, talk about um, ways of involving people um, and citizens uh, in designing new mobility. Um, James. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, good good morning, everybody. I can hope you see my screen and can hope you can also hear me as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's been kind of I don't know how everybody else is kind of feeling. It's been really interesting to come here after all the presentations, which kind of, all the fascinating presentations which kind of taken place, uh, come before myself and like how different organizations come ranging from policymakers to people who are actually doing this stuff um has range kind of like the range of approaches which are kind of taking place um but it's, i think it's fair to say that probably the last three weeks has changed everything um and i, I don't say that as like flippantly it's it's kind of it's quite frankly it's kind of rocked kind of transport and kind of how we probably how we think about it right to its core and whilst there's obviously a lot of thoughts about well how do we then uh, deal with this crisis how do we then look, come look to recover from it do we try and get back to, back to some sense of normality and of course rural transport has been significantly affected and come rural communities have been significantly affected um but this has certainly been a noticeable kind of mind shift in terms of how people can think about their role within society and can some may consider that actually it's going to be a result of this situation but it's can certainly been noticeable because certainly kind of one of the ethos is become by which i try and approach my work it's kind of quite a simple one is People think and di act differently as citizens than as they do as users. And there's been a lot of talk over the last few years about we're going to have kind of user-centered mobility. We've got to be able to provide kind of tailored kind of transport services. We've got to kind of make it attractive to people, kind of make it reactive to their needs. Um, not only would I actually argue we do have already have a completely user-centered transport system, it just so happens to be a single occupancy car, which is completely kind of inefficient and has all the all the sorts of positives and negatives associated with it. But when you actually try and reframe uh, the conversation with people about, well, actually, what what does your community need and what do you then need as citizens, as opposed to do you then need a new new mobility service or do you then need a new um, mobility application or come combined service offering you then start to shift the can shift the conversation come quite fundamentally um because if you just come then think about yourself as perhaps as a user and then think yourself as a sit think yourself as a citizen um you can think of it in a couple of kind of a couple of different ways so um i can put these couple kind of pictures up here and they're, they're kind of quite flippant i suppose so when you kind of think yourself as a user you kind of think about well, what what's the goal which you're trying to achieve whether or not it's trying i'm trying to get to work i'm trying to get to um come do my shopping or I'm trying to get past this person who's driving me at 40 miles an hour and a 60 mile an hour limit, and they're really frustrating me, and they're really, and why won't they just kind of let us pass that sort of, that sort of thing? As I said, I'm quite flippant, but when you can think of yourself as a citizen, and when you start thinking about, well, okay, what are the then the needs of my community, and what are then the needs uh, of other people, and can, particularly can some of the most vulnerable, and um, you start to then kind of think, you start to think about transport and mobility in a different way. And it's kind of very important that we start to, when we actually try and engage with 
come with rural communities, actually not just rural communities, but communities more generally, we start to frame the conversation about well, okay, what do you, what does your community need? And try and yeah, come try and uh, come tease out some insight into yeah, come what those needs of citizens are first, as opposed to come what those needs of users are. Um, because the way which come the frame which we frame this conversation with people about what are their different transport priorities, what are their different transport needs, is being shifted from, from COVID nineteen. So I suppose if you come to starting all the way over here on the left about the user, which has come been quite a dominant narrative over the last four or five years. If you just ask people what they want, they say stuff right, we want free parking, more parking cheap public transport, we want bike lanes, we want come the moon on the stick, essentially. Of course, there are methods by which you can use and say, well, okay, what do you then, what do you then really actually need? What do you then really, um, yeah, can you dry, dive into those things in a, little, in a little bit more detail? But certainly people who have experience of a traditional public consultation, let's say, when you ask them what they want, they'll probably come expect these sorts of things. And it becomes very, very difficult conversation in order to uh, facilitate. But when you start thinking, of course, then you then start moving into, into how you then think about people, ask them as like the public, and then you do ask them what they need. And this is kind of where transport planning is at. So, okay, what do we then need is we need to get to work. We need to get to doctor's appointment. What's the best way for me to, for the kids to get to school? Has to be safe on water and cycle. And that's kind of, that's kind of a really good, um, kind of good next phase. But when you start thinking about what are then your needs as citizens? And you then start thinking about, well, okay, what are then the needs of others? And how does that then prioritize in relation to oneself? So, okay, you say, well, okay, I still need to get to work and still getting to work is very important. But actually, when we start thinking about, well, actually, in terms of investment priorities, we shouldn't be looking to help out the most vulnerable first. We should have streets where people feel safe to play. and when you start to shift that um, engagement with people and you shift that, um, yeah, shift, you can reframe that conversation in that way, you get a much more, a much deeper, kind of a much richer uh, level of in, level of insight associated with it. And certainly kind of one thing which I've noticed, and I've got to admit this is anecdotal as opposed to having necessarily any hard data, is that because of kind of the way which COVID-19 has played out, there's been much more of a conversation uh, come publicly into the needs of citizens and how do we come help to protect, how do we help out the most vulnerable first? And then almost like, yeah, for those of us who are able to take the hit, then we're able to do so. Um, Martin made a point earlier on, for instance, around this, how there's been a big shift to come remote working. And that's been, yeah, that's un undoubtedly that has happened. But one, but at the same time, in support of that, there's also been a significant shift in terms of helping out, basically I'm helping out people in local communities when and when you're able to do so as well. So it's kind of not just about how you change your own travel behaviours, but then how you then start to contribute to a much wider agenda. Um, and I suppose that it also then comes back to a uh, common often quoted phase is that necessity is the mother of all invention. And if we're talking about re innovation, then surely it, it's kind of logical that if innovation comes from the greatest needs, then the rural areas are innovation hotbeds. Of course, that then depends upon how you then define it. And so if you can look at official government statistics about research and development priorities, um, who gets the who gets the most funding, who gets the um, and also can well the different mobility solutions are taking place, you will then find it's actually in in cities and it's in urban and it's in urban areas where there's a greater concentration of people. But that then means that actually the good stuff which is actually taking place in rural areas is often um underplayed so i can use a recent example here on in the presentation slides uh, so this was the big hospital in wuhan which was um 
erected in about 10 days um, in response to the current crisis. And obviously that made international news. That was kind of something which was very visible. What actually people didn't realize was a lot of the other, a lot of other things which were taking place in China at the exact same time. So for example, um, 70 new medical facilities appeared in rural areas in the Hubei province uh, to provide a very similar scale of operation to this new hospital here. Um, but also um, you had innovation from the likes of Alibaba who set up an online agricultural produce platform when all the different markets uh, across cities across China were, were closed. It then meant that different um, different rural providers come at no cost were still able to sell some of their produce. And that kind of obviously that kind of went kind of a little bit under the radar in terms of what was do, what was doing. And of course, we're still too early right now to see what the impact has been. But that I suppose then come, comes back to a point of there is some innovative stuff which is taking place in rural in rural areas. It's just then kind of the nature of it and the nature by which it um, it comes about is not in a traditional way. I think about things and I suppose it can comes down to another dominant narrative which we have about innovation which is if it doesn't scale or if it isn't profitable is it useful and that's come that's been a difficult question for policymakers more generally but I would certainly argue the point that um, the most important thing is that the innovation is useful and if it doesn't so happen to make money or if it doesn't happen to scale outside the village for instance that does not mean it's still not worthwhile, even if from our traditional metrics about how we measure innovation don't determine it to be. So I've put up again a couple of examples here. So some of you may know um, Beata Kubitz, who does a lot of great work on future mobility, but she's also involved in this e-cargo bike uh, delivery um, scheme which has been set up over the last few weeks in, in Todd Morden. And over the last three weeks, and essentially from nothing, so they've done 150 deliveries, they've covered 200 miles on, on their bikes, and they've estimated around 30 grams of CO2 has been saved over the three weeks they've been operational. And that's been mainly to serve the existing market, uh, tra market traders in Todd Morden, who have obviously been impacted by COVID-19. And there wasn't necessarily come a significant innovation here. It was essentially just a load of, load of e-cargo bikes um, and spreadsheet and Google Maps to start with. Um, although obviously they've come, Beata is come on the on the call at the moment. She's probably saying actually, yeah, we've done a lot more than that since then, which is fine. Okay, so but yeah, that's still then providing a useful service and it's providing that lifeline to local retailers and to local operators, even if it's not actually necessarily making any money. And another example here is, uh, this is something called an Epi Shuttle, which is being uh, used to transfer um, COVID-19 patients from the Scottish islands to the mainland for treatment. And this was actually a slight adaptation on an existing service offering, but they've, been able to adopt this and been able to adapt some planes which serve the serve these islands very quickly so that they're then able to yeah to transfer these kind of different patients um into the mainland for treatment now of course again that's not necessarily making any money that's providing a useful service and that's probably very few people would argue that it isn't useful or kind of it isn't valuable but because it's not necessarily scaling or it's not necessarily profitable in the way which we think about it, as so much of rural, different rural innovations are, um, it perhaps doesn't get can get the same level of, of interest as say, some, like say somebody producing an app which has 750,000 signups to help volunteer with the NHS, for instance. But there's all these sorts of different innovations which are always taking place all the time and even even minor things like uh, offering lifts and offering to go and pick up prescriptions on facebook groups and there's all these sorts of different innovative activities which are happening right now within our rural areas but they because they don't have the scale and don't and it's and not because it's not profitable we don't have actually that so we don't actually see um kind of understand the usefulness of it 
And what's been really what's been really key to a lot of this is that not only have people actually just gone ahead and done it because the the situation has has necessitated it, but also there's been a built upon a lot of strong community bonds. And a part of this is actually about conflict resolution. Now, of course, again, come the unique times in which we face, there's we're all pushing towards a common goal at the moment. But people do have different visions and about the future of transport and future mobility in rural areas, and they feel very passionate about them. And obviously, if you're not then careful, then strong voices do tend to dominate it. And so what you then have to be able to do is you have to be able to find neutral ground in order to discuss, in order to debate uh, kind of what the future of mobility may be like in your in your particular rural area. Um, I can cite an example of a project which we did early last early last year in in Veruri in Scotland with uh, with Jenny Milne and connected connected places catapult, where we actually purposely can set out to understand what were the needs of citizens and provide this kind of neutral space, this neutral workshop space that's informed by data analytics for them to discuss different visions and to discuss the um kind of what their solutions would be based upon this strong community needs and that identified kind of a series of projects which were which were to be taken forward but what was the value what the value of doing that was wasn't necessarily that we necessarily got a great product out of it or you got a great project out of it but you just provided that space and you provide that means for people to discuss and to debate about different needs of different citizens and to then come to some sort of consensus on solutions actually the solutions which we which were posed by the different groups were almost kind of traditional in, in many traditional in many respects around you know providing new transport services or providing integrated ticketing but even if we came to that same outcome the fact that we went through this process and the fact that it was kind of so well supported by different community groups meant it kind of had a value meant it had that sense of community ownership and this is something which is which has taken place before COVID-19 but I would argue certainly is had taken on a life of its own in the meantime communities should actually be set in the direction by which they want to go in even if they are not necessarily the experts on it um so it's it, it can be What's the, what's the best way of describing this, I suppose? It's very easy for transport planning and transport policy makers to be solution led and say, well, okay, here we here we have a problem and here is a solution. And we can know that we obviously know the best. We know we're transport planners, we're transport experts, we know what's going we know what's going to work. When actually what community not only do communities want much more of a say, but they want much more of an input in terms of what the end vision looks like, what the end uh, picture of mobility end picture of mobility looks like. And so it's then up to us as professionals, whether they be come communities and particularly in rural areas, to actually define what that work with them to define what that future is and to lend them our expertise and lend them our advice to say well okay you can try all these different solutions you can identify all these different solutions um but yeah here's what may work here's what may not here's may not work but ultimately the end vision is end vision is yours and we've come done but but most importantly and again i can just reflecting on the last few weeks if you give people the opportunity, if you give people the space and you give them the means by which you can enable them to make a difference, they will do amazing things. And that's particularly the case in, in the more rural areas where in many respects they're used to doing this because um, the most important mode of transport other than single occupancy car in rural areas is actually getting a lift from somebody in a car rural areas are very self-reliant they're very self-driven they are um because they need to be in some respects but what they do not have is they do not have the space the opportunity the resources and um in some respects come the ability necessarily to make that make that difference and to actually 
take that lead on and to kind of take that charge for themselves. So it's then up to us as professionals to say, well, okay, we'll give you this, we'll give you this opportunity, we'll give you this space, we will give you open data, we'll give you tools, we'll lend you our expertise, and we will work with you to actually design new services and to design these future visions for your area, then they'll do amazing things. People care about their communities, people care about their areas. We've seen that over the last few weeks that come far be it from also user-centered uh, approach to mobility or user-centered consumeristic uh, approach to life. We're citizens, ultimately. We, we care about our communities. We care about each other. We care about um, our, our place in society. And when we're given the opportunity to do something creative, we do something innovative, we take it. And so perhaps us as transport planners and come as professionals, we should be as much as delivering services for the public and doing necessary minimum things around public transport provision, for example, we should actually be helping our communities as well. We should be empowering them as much as providing for them. And so that's kind of really what I wanted to say. Um, but thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, uh, uh, James. That was um, uh, really interesting, really good. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, James Palmer has had to leave us now. So um, uh, I, I was going to ask him uh, to direct one of the questions at him. Um, can I? Uh, we've got a minute or two just to take one or two things in. Uh, can I pick up one that's coming from Nick Reed? Um, uh, any thoughts on how perceptions of sharing may change given the current crisis and any steps that enterprise um, are taking to address this? Um, ben, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, certainly. Well, I guess the immediate reaction for us was we had to make some changes to our car club provision to make sure that the vehicles were cleaned in between every single usage, which for those of you familiar with the car club industry, that's the automated rental industry, that's not always um, the, the case, but that's what consumers need right now, so that's what we've done. In terms of shared transit, I think it's a fantastic question that nobody knows the real answer to in terms of as we come out of the COVID situation and as we move to uh, an easing situation, but possibly before a cure is found, people's attitudes towards that shared transit and how people will work together in more confined spaces is going to be very interesting. We are looking at the solutions that people will need to supplement public transport in that particular time frame. Um, we're seeing a lot of businesses asking us to provide different solutions that they, they're not yet comfortable with the idea of people going immediately back to buses and trains, but we need to to, to be able to react to that because that will probably change relatively quickly over time as people settle back into uh, be, being able to, to, to use mass transit. But I go back to in these times where people's needs and desires are changing, I think visibility of those options is absolutely critical. And that's where if we provide the correct visibility through things like mobility as a service, then we can start influencing choices as people's ability to, to, to react to that changes. So as an example, if people are using a mass application which has some governance by the local authority, if people are using that and not wishing to go to public transport as much or shared mobility as much in the early days after a lockdown, that becomes very visible, but we can provide reactions to that, incentives to that, or monitoring to that to say, well, what if we did certain changes? What if we changed what shared mobility means? So I think it's a great question that there isn't a clear direction on, on what the answer is post lockdown. But the immediacy definitely is very much about uh, cleanliness and the sterile nature of those shared transport options um, in between every every user. Thanks. Um, 
gosh um uh yeah, uh, so somebody's, uh, Gareth Blackett has asked, how can rural mass ever be viable when the benefits of agglomeration are absent, as is an adequate um, digital infrastructure? Um, and um, a second one, uh, two related questions, one from Sylvia Barrett um, and one from, um, hang on, where are we? Um, uh, uh, Mike, um, oh, hang on, I'll find him, about demand responsive transport, um, saying that, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'll just find it, um, um, uh, saying, do, would demand responsive transport be an appropriate way into this? Uh, Sylvia is asking, um, how do we make, um, oh gosh, um, my dashboard's playing, um, uh, should we be thinking about different forms of bus services rather than just providing conventional bus services? Um, would uh, Ben or others like to pick that up, Martin, possibly? Maybe, maybe if I just pick up on that, that, that first point in terms of rural mass, if, if that's okay. I, I think the, the, the couple of comments that I'd, I'd throw there, having, you know, we have done uh, rural mass and some of those I, I think the, the benefits are clearly there, not just for the users, but for the participating companies. When you put mobility solutions into rural areas, our, our findings are they actually get used more than they do in the major urban areas where we already have a, a, such a large variety of choice. So putting things like car clubs into the highlands, the demand for those vehicles has been huge. The demand is reflective of how people can find out that those solutions are there. And the digitization, uh, you, know, you don't need 5G connectivity to be able to have mass um, connectivity. All you really need is a mobile signal, which may not be fantastic in ultra rural areas or some ultra rural areas, but it's pretty good connectivity today. So I think the, the, the benefits really are there. And I think the trial that we'll be doing in the Highlands will, will really expose that. I really believe that we'll see a big uptick in that um, based, off, uh, based off the publicity. And on the DRT point, I think that's fantastic because people are going to be looking to different solutions for, for, for buses or even different ways buses can help out. But I'm a big believer, and we, we're working with some of the DRT providers in terms of making sure those assets, those vehicle assets, are used by multiple people. So as an example, a, a minibus or an accessible minibus that might be part of a DRT solution during morning and evening rush hours, well, that should be used by schools or communities during the downtime. So that asset should be used 24-7, not just during the peak bus, bus time. Stephen, can I can I just come back and come in as well? I mean, I, I think for me, this that I, I think we need to take a step back. I, I would totally agree that digital infrastructure is going to become um, a, a clear priority for people to invest in, and we've got to crack the issue of how do we get the level of connectivity, digital connectivity, in rural areas that um, those in more urban areas are benefiting from. And we know some of the barriers there, but if we're thinking about what is it we want for our communities and our society, we need to think about how we get a business model that allows the digital infrastructure to be in place. I think we then need to just kind of, as I say, take a step back and say, if this is, if, if, our, if the question being asked is, how do you change the way that the travel that used to happen is going to happen into the future. I think we're missing the fundamental point here. If you're someone who has um, lives in a, a smaller town or rural community who has in the past been traveling to an office block uh, and maybe taking, I don't know, an hour or an hour and a half or whatever the time might be, do you want um, to go back? Do you actually, do you want to go back to that type of lifestyle? More fundamentally, will your business want to have the cost of maintaining an asset when it knows from a business perspective, it might well be able to achieve it by working more remotely? which it comes to the why it's all about what is it we want in terms of place. And I think uh, Mayor Palmer's point about is thinking about what is it that makes a place sustainable in terms of the facilities, the, the housing, the accommodation. 
I think we will see a conversation going on around what makes that place sustainable as a place to do work from. You go to a number of the more uh, of some smaller towns, you see um, you see popping up some of these work hubs which are accessible. You don't they're not just for one company, they're for people to be able to drop in, have all the benefits of a, an office type environment. So you have that co community and collective of working in some company, but without the disbenefit of having to travel extensive distances to, to join uh, an office. So I, I, I really think that some of these questions are a bit more fundamental. What do we want um, to need? What do we need to help make our communities sustainable? What do they need as users, as individuals, to get access to facilities and opportunities? And how can we make that um, in a way that suits their aspirations for lifestyles moving forward, which may not necessarily be the same aspirations as we had in February of this year, which will be about being able to drive long distances on a regular basis, uh, even if they enjoy the driving, it may be that that's not part of their lifestyle, having had some of the experiences of, of, of late. Thanks. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the question of demand response to transport, um, uh, I, I wanted to comment on this because it's something the University of Hertfordshire is looking at. Um, various people have raised this as something the time might come, uh, has come. Um, I think the um, question, uh, I, it, my sense is that the problem with demand responsive transport is that people are throwing it at the wall and hoping that some of it sticks. So the university is keen and some of the people on this call, I, I notice are people we've worked with, we've been talking to about this, in just taking a look at what are the use cases where demand responsive transport's the right thing, or as Sylvia Barrett's commented from uh, Campaign for Better Transport's commented, um, conventional public transport people have confidence in because it's a fixed route, whereas um, flexible public transport might be the right thing to do, but people might feel less confident about it. So there are, are challenges there. Um, we're aware of lots of different types of demand responsive transport. Ben's talked about some of them. Um, I think it's a, a really interesting area and I think the question is where can these be effective, not necessarily as James says profitable, but effective answers to what um, uh, to, to accessibility in uh, rural areas. I don't know if any of the panellists want to comment and then I think we're going to have to finish. I, I think that's ex exactly right. I, I think in other countries there are examples of how things like demand responsive transit or things that aren't known as de demand responsive transit operate and are given subsidies which are cheaper than alternative ways of doing it under traditional public transport. So I think you're right. And I think Martin also made a fantastic point that as people are going to be doing different versions of commutes going forward, maybe not commuting five days a week, maybe only commuting one day a week, that these types of mobility become even more important because they give us the ability not to own the car or not to own the second car as long as we can provide you know, the right palatable solutions for people to use. And demand responsive is absolutely part of that. Just to build on, on that, I think one of the things um, we need to ask ourselves as a profession is whether um, uh, whether the way we approach the provision of transport services at the moment is actually the right way for the user. So if I'm a user um, and I want to make a journey from a point A to point B, my needs will be different depending upon is it me? Is it somebody and they are with somebody or is it is a group? Is it a work journey? Is it a leisure journey? Have I got luggage? The needs of my journey are going to be different between two points depending on a whole range of factors. What we need is a solution and what we need is a regulatory framework that allows a solution to tailor to the needs of the user rather than the needs of the provider. And we've got an opportunity with the Department for Transport's consultation at the moment on the future of, of regulation for in the context of future mobility to actually stop and think about whether the way we define things, whether it's a conventional bus, a DRT service or shared use or what have you, 
whether those definitions are actually part of the barrier to providers of services responding to the user needs. It's a focus that we've really emphasized in the development of our draft transport strategy. We've got to put the user at the heart of this decision-making process. We've got to understand what are the user needs, how they will vary, how they will alter, and we need to give the user the flexibility in those services if they're going to be able to be comfortable about um, making their locational choices in terms of where they live, what they do in their in their work uh, and what they do in their leisure time. So I think for me there are so many opportunities coming out of the current situation for us to just take a step back and challenge some of the things that we've known for some time are barriers to doing the innovative types of solutions that we've all touched on in these conversations today. Let's take that opportunity to say what do we need in terms of the regulatory framework, in terms of how we prioritise investment, how we work with the public private sectors to deliver what the user needs. And that's got to be the focus moving forward. Very much. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, I'm aware of, you know, as ever, these things that a lot of uh, questions have started to come in. Uh, Ken Mercer has asked, uh, the key to rural travel is versatility, availability and affordability, which is currently only really achievable by car travel. How do we address this? Pre-Beach and other visions address these issues and provide the opportunity for active travel. Have we not gone backwards? How can we address this without significant funding? Um, my answer to that would be, we will need some funding. But I think what you've heard from the panel today is that we can make much better use of the funding and assets that are out there. So shared transport, shared assets, shared cars um, can actually make things work better um, because um, the affordability for cars for many people isn't, uh, uh, cars in rural areas aren't really very affordable for some people. So actually the kinds of things we've been talking about today are I think actually helpful um, for the for all bit on the title of this. Um, I'm conscious of time uh, and I think we probably should um, uh, should start to wind up. Uh, are there any final comments from members of the panel who want to say anything about aspects of what's been talked about today? Um, and then um, we'll perhaps wind up. Um, Martin, do you want to say anything? <laughs> I, I want to say I think uh, this has been a really timely conversation and it's one that we need to um, to sort of build upon. I, I think in your introduction, Stephen, you kind of touched on the fact that um, whilst there is always a lot of uh, focus on the urban areas because there is a density and there's an opportunity to do things uh, at scale to allow to do things differently, there's an awful lot of our um, country, which is the smaller market towns, the rural hinterlands, places that we actually want to see prosper and grow uh, in, 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 in moving forward. And so understanding and thinking about what is it that those communities need to support them is actually really fundamental. It's actually a strategic issue. We often talk about strategies and we think about big pieces of infrastructure, but as you've touched on in your, your last comment, this is a strategic issue because of the number of people uh, it affects and that actually the opportunity to make some quite different choices which will benefit a significant part of the population as well so I think it's a timely conversation and it's certainly one that uh, I think we should continue and I would hope that um, some of the emerging policy frameworks like that which we're going to put publish later this year as the uh, the draft transport strategy for the heartland will have encourage people to, to build on that conversation moving forward thank you Ben yeah, I think they, they were great points from Martin. I, I think I'd only add that as we look at what some of these innovations uh, coming down the line need to be, remembering that no single um, part of this, no single modal, no single innovation will cure this on its own. It's part of a, a collection of different things that will assist. But we need to make sure that whatever that collection of, uh, of, of modals is, public-private sector partnerships, they need to pass that stress test that says, if I if something different happens from the norm, will I still be able to get home or will I still be able to get to work? Because that's why people are still having private cars, 
first set, first car household, second car household, etc. So we need to pass that stress test to show the combined solutions uh, mean that we don't need to do that. Um, and thanks. And James? I suppose, yeah, I'd just, um, it's kind of a recommendation, I suppose, to the 140 people kind of still still on here. Um, many of us have uh, come a fair bit of time now. Um, or come, and then you probably come still to have a fair, fair bit of time. So just take 10 minutes, take 10, 15 minutes, and just have a Google search about some of the kind of more innovative uh, business solutions, innovative transport solutions, which are kind of emerging right now, and, tr and look outside the traditional places, because there's no, obviously there's no doubt about it, this is a very scary time, this is a very um, kind of quite dire situation in some respects, but there are some really innovative things taking place out there. There are some really creative solutions which are being developed right now, which we're all missing, and it's worthwhile just having a look for them, having a read about them, and just thinking to yourself, how can I enable that sort of thing? How can I enable that thing to either be generate more ideas like that, or to be um, help it help to help to sustain it? Because yeah, we, otherwise we're we're not going to learn anything from this whole situation. And so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, James, and uh, thanks to, to uh, all the panellists and also the people who posted questions. Um, as ever, we've overrun the time that we allocated to this, um, but I hope people have found it interesting. Um, I, I've noticed from um, the questions a lot of people who I know are very active in this area, um, and um, uh, some of the discussions with some of these people are going to be taken, as I say, into smaller groups through the University of Hertfordshire's Future of Transport and Counties um, programme of round tables that we're putting together, um, and um, from which will come um, a set of ideas and uh, proposals, and also proposals for further research like demand responsive transport, mobility hubs, um, and a range of other initiatives. There's one thing that nobody's mentioned on this call, which I think could be a real game changer in rural areas, and that's e-bikes. I mean, we've heard mention of e-cargo bikes in um, uh, uh, in West Yorkshire, but um, I think the point about e-bikes e is that they give a much longer range um, for a, rain, a much wider range of people to get around and could potentially change a lot of travel patterns quite quickly in more rural areas, always, of course, um, assuming that they can get access to um, dedicated routes that feel reasonably safe for people to use. So I'd leave you with that thought. What we've heard today, I think, is some really good contributions with some really practical ideas and examples of what's actually going on in rural areas <clears throat> and also some reflections on how things might change given the current crisis. This is one of a series of webinars that Smart Transport are putting together. Um, if you go online, you can see uh, the others coming up. Um, there's also now a live website uh, of Smart Transport, and you can also sign up to weekly um, newsletters um, coming to your inbox, summarising uh, the latest action in and around transport uh, and smart transport in particular. Um, thank you to the panellists and thank you to the organisers. Thank you to Jeremy Bennett in particular as one of the people who's actually held this together in the back room. And um, I hope people continue to stay safe. Thank you very much.